The story begins on the outskirts of a quiet and peaceful little town where two kids are learning the art of swordplay. Our protagonist, Lythe, isn't very good, and he is getting pushed around by his companion, Sarah, whose fencing and sword fighting skills are impressive even at a young age. Our boy is trying his best to remind his friend that this is just a friendly sparring session, but the girl is telling him to man up and go all out. She explains that they are never going to become holy knights if they don't train as hard as they possibly can, since you need to be among the strongest warriors in the world to be chosen for that prestigious role. Still, she can see that her companion isn't doing too well, so she decides to give him a break and they sit down to have lunch. While they are busy devouring their sandwiches, Sarah tells Lythe that the only way to get stronger is to train as hard as you can because strength is everything in this world. While she is trying her best to inspire our protagonist, he is lost in thoughts about how he even became friends with this wild girl. As far as he can remember, she has been around him ever since he began crawling, and she has always been extremely kind to him, and she even goes out of her way to take care of him. In a way, she is more like a sister than a friend, and the two of them even fight like a couple of siblings. Now Sarah has always dreamt about becoming a holy knight, and since our boy is her best friend, she decided to train him as well so that he can join her one day. Even though Lythe doesn't really like to spend his youth training like a madman, he still likes hanging out with her, and that's why he always brings her some food whenever they do these sparring sessions. While our protagonist is busy reminiscing about the past, Sarah quickly finishes her meal and gets ready to start training again. This is when Lythe asks her if she knows about the people who live in the 4th Division. He tells his friend that those people have next to nothing to their names and they are having an extremely hard time even feeding their children. Seeing them trying to survive in such horrible living conditions has made Lythe acutely aware of the injustice that exists in this world. However, he is still hopeful because regardless of the kind of life you have lived, you can always move up in society once you turn 18. This is the age when the gods assign you to different classes and they can range from being a blade master on one end to working in the fields as a farmer on the other. Now there is no law that forces you to live according to the class you have been given. However, Lythe knows pretty well that there are certain jobs that you simply cannot do unless you belong to a specific class. For instance, farmers or merchants can't really get any work as adventurers because you need to be in a warrior class in order to fulfill the requirements of this job. As far as he knows, it is pretty much impossible to break free of the class system and do whatever you want regardless of what kind of job you have been assigned. He's thinking about all of this when Sarah swings her sword right at him and this finally brings Lythe back to Earth. He is looking at her with a surprised expression when she tells him that he shouldn't worry about his future because as long as he keeps training, he will get into a strong class. A few years later, both the kids have now become adults and they are ready to see what kind of class they will be assigned to. That's exactly why they are visiting the Imperial Capital to attend the Division Ceremony. They know that many people attend the ceremony every year, but they are still shocked by how crowded the streets are. The whole place looks like a huge summer festival and everyone they come across seems extremely excited about what kind of future awaits them. Sarah is probably the most excited person out there and her goofy attitude is making our boy laugh. As the two of them walk through the streets, a few people recognize Lythe since he happens to be the son of a very popular duke. Our boy of course doesn't like all of this attention, but he still greets those people with a polite smile before continuing towards the main citadel where the ceremony will take place. As soon as they step into this holy building, they are amazed by its grandeur and they simply can't believe how many people are waiting to receive a class just like them. Some of these people have already been assigned roles and their faces make it clear what kind of class they have received. For instance, the people assigned to combat-oriented roles look excited and happy. Meanwhile, those who received ordinary classes look rather disappointed with the outcome even though those aren't bad roles whatsoever. Our protagonist is busy looking around when suddenly he hears someone mention that his father, Duke Ride Wellesley, has also come here to attend the ceremony. Now the Duke is an extremely strong holy knight, and that's exactly why he's been assigned to protect these lands, but he effectively rules them. He's very popular among the citizens of the country, but he doesn't really pay much attention to his own son, who also tries to hide from his father. The Duke hasn't come alone to the ceremony, however, and there is another young man following him closely behind. When Sarah points him out, Lythe explains that the scary-looking dude is actually his half-brother Kite. With a sad and disappointed look on his face, our protagonist proceeds to tell his friend that his half-brother comes from the 4th Division and that's exactly why their father has never really paid much attention to him. That's just how aristocrats act in this society, and even though it's sad, Reedy's actions are pretty normal. The two of them are talking about this when the priest asks Kite to come near the altar. The guy follows the instructions and proceeds to put his hand on a strange crystal to begin the division process. It doesn't take long before a symbol appears in front of him, and this causes a huge uproar inside the citadel. 
everyone knows this symbol since they all wanted to see it during their own division ceremony. It basically means that Ride's abandoned son is actually a holy knight which makes him an extremely rare type of warrior. According to common knowledge, only one out of 10,000 citizens ends up becoming a holy knight and that's why these warriors receive so much reverence and respect. While the crowd is busy uploading Kite, his father silently approaches him and tells everyone that this special warrior happens to be his son. This announcement shocks the newly chosen Holy Knight who doesn't even remember the last time his father acknowledged him or treated him like his own blood. It's clear to him that Ride has only decided to recognize him as his son because he has joined a very special class of warriors and the Duke plans to use him to strengthen his own authority. At first, Kite thinks about telling everyone how his father abandoned him when he was just a child. However, he also has some grand schemes and he decides to act like Ride's pawn for the time being. After his assessment, the priest calls Sarah to come up to the altar and she's a little nervous as she puts her hand on that crystal. It turns out she didn't have any reason to be worried because she's also assigned to the Holy Knight class. We already know how rare these warriors are so it's pretty much impossible for two Holy Knights to be selected on the same day. However, Sarah doesn't care about any of that, and she's just happy that all her hard work has finally paid off. She immediately runs over to Lythe and tells him that she'll be waiting for him to join her as one of the elite warriors of this kingdom. Our protagonist, meanwhile, just gives her a nervous smile and walks toward the priest. He's taking slow steps, and he can see his father glaring at him with a look that says, Don't be a disappointment to our family. There's so much pressure on Lythe's shoulders and he knows that his chances of becoming a holy knight are next to none, especially now that two of them have already been selected. Still, he isn't about to give up, so, with a determined final step, he finally reaches the altar and places his hand on the crystal. Everyone inside the Citadel is eager to see which class he'll get. Ride is already making plans about how he's going to use his sons to establish his own dominance. However, even after placing his hand on the crystal for a few minutes, no symbol appears in front of Lythe. This doesn't make any sense, and as far as the priest knows, it just means that the crystal isn't reacting to our boy. Our protagonist is still in shock because of what just happened when the priest tells everyone that from this day on, life is jobless as far as the gods are concerned. Later that night, our boy is sitting alone in his room inside the Wellesley residence when his father calls for him. He already knows that he's about to receive some rather harsh words instead of any kind of emotional support from Ride. However, he never expected his father to be so ruthless. Without any hesitation, the Duke tells his son that from this day on, he has no relationship to him or this family. He says that he doesn't even see Lythe as his son anymore, and from this day on, Kite will be his heir. Our protagonist is shocked that his father is not only cutting him off from his family, but the old man also gives our boy just one hour to collect his things and get out of the mansion. That night, while Lythe is leaving town and thinking about what kind of job he's going to do, Sarah is busy celebrating with her family and friends. Her father is praising her for working so hard and becoming a holy knight against all odds. She can't help but be happy because it has been her lifelong dream. However, she simply can't enjoy this moment like she wanted to because her best friend is going through a very tough time right now and she knows it better than anyone else. She's thinking about him when one of her friends mentions that he saw Lythe leave town earlier that night. This turns out to be too much for Sarah who simply can't let her best friend leave without a goodbye, so she tells everyone to keep on drinking as she runs out of the pub and starts looking around town to find our protagonist. She's asking people on the streets if they have seen the Duke's son, but no one is really helping her. She doesn't know it, but she almost found Lythe in one of the alleys, but she failed to notice him, and he also didn't see her. While she is trying desperately to look for him, our protagonist just wants to leave this town that reminds him of all the disappointment he has faced in the last couple of days. So, the next morning, he decides to join some mercenaries as a helper to make some money. Since he doesn't really have a useful skill or any skill at all, all he can do is carry their equipment as they travel from one place to the other to complete their tasks. Even though he's not doing a rewarding job, Lythe is still happy to be around people who don't care about his class or the kind of life he previously had. They treat him nicely and even make jokes to cheer him up, making sure that he doesn't really feel alone. Still, it's totally understandable why our protagonist feels like a nobody. He has trained himself to fight against the strongest enemy, and now he is nothing more than a manservant. Lythe spends the next few days in relative peace as he walks through the country with his mercenary party. However, this peace doesn't last very long. One afternoon, they are accompanying an old merchant and his young daughter when they get ambushed by a group of bandits in the middle of the woods. These criminals are strong, and it doesn't take long for them to take down all of Lythe's companions. Our protagonist watches in complete horror as the bandits decide to take out all the witnesses before getting out of there with their newly acquired loot. In this moment while he's facing certain death, our boy decides to use all of his training to make one final stand against these evil men. 
He knows that he doesn't really have a chance of beating so many people who have combat skills, but he wants to die with his head held high instead of getting butchered like a farm animal. That's exactly why he grabs one of the swords and runs at the leader of these bandits. He is fast, and he certainly knows how to handle a sword, but he soon realizes that these criminals aren't weak by any stretch of the imagination. The bandit leader easily parries his attack and throws them on the ground before asking Lythe why he's even trying. While all of this is going down, the little girl remembers what her father told her about different classes. The old merchant explained to her earlier that after turning 18, people get assigned to become warriors like the mercenaries or merchants like him. Many people also get classified as farmers, and their job is raising crops and it's usually a good idea to stick to the kind of work that suits your class. After remembering this, the girl stares at our protagonist who looks bruised and battered and she thinks that he might be a blade master. However, Lythe wasn't lucky enough to become a part of such a useful class, and he has pretty much no skills that can help him in battle. His enemy, on the other hand, enjoys skills like physical boost that allow him to cut through anything with his sword. Our protagonist soon begins to notice this disparity in strength as his sword begins to crack. He knows that he won't last too long if he continues fighting the old bandit like a maniac. He's trying to come up with a plan that can save his life as well as the lives of the merchant and his daughter. However, he doesn't really get a chance to think for long because the bandit sends him flying into the air with a single kick. By this point, even the bandit realizes that this boy doesn't have any useful skills, so he decides to stop playing around with his food and asks his men to finish off all the witnesses. At that moment, Lythe desperately asks the gods why they made him so weak that he can't even save lives by taking down these evil men. He knows he's about to die, but as a last-ditch effort, he tries to fight back by grabbing his dagger. The bandit doesn't like Lythe's rebellious attitude and he decides to end this fight, but just then our protagonist hears a strange voice in his head. The voice tells him that he has acquired two new skills. One of them happens to be the physical boost that the bandit leader is using, and the other one is the blade boost, which makes his weapon extremely strong. Our boy is familiar with these skills, and he knows that by using them he can definitely fight back and that's exactly what he does. He not only stops the attacks that are coming his way, but also begins a counter-offensive against the bandits who don't even understand what's going on. While they are shocked by the strength that Lythe has gained out of nowhere, he begins eliminating them, and it's not long before he's the only one left standing. The merchant and his daughter are watching all of this intently, and as soon as our protagonist takes down the last bandit, the little girl runs towards him and gives him a big hug before breaking down into tears. She starts telling him how scared she was, and our boy can understand her fear since this little kid just had a near-death experience. He's trying to calm her down when the merchant tells him that they are only alive because of him. This is a big realization because our boy has never really saved someone's life before. He is still trying to process everything that just happened when the old man asks if he also happens to be part of a warrior class. I mean it's a fair assessment since only people assigned to combat-oriented classes can display such supreme swordsmanship while their life is on the line. It's easy to understand why the merchant is so surprised after learning that officially Lythe is jobless. Our protagonist still remembers that voice in his head, and as far as he knows his prayers were answered, and God gave him these special skills just to survive that terrible situation. And no matter how he got those skills, he's just happy that he was strong enough to save these people who clearly didn't deserve to die at the hands of some petty criminals. He is just thinking about all of this when the old merchant says he would like to reward Lythe in some way for saving him and his daughter. Since he's a businessman, he can definitely give our boy some much-needed money now, but our protagonist is not really looking for any kind of financial reward. However, he knows that the merchant can definitely help him in one other way, so he asks the old man to write a letter for him. The next day, he goes back to the capital to meet up with the head priest, Augustine, inside the citadel. He is looking to get a reassessment of his innate skills, but the old priest thinks it's a waste of time, and he tells his servant to send Lythe back. He does, however, change his mind when the servant gives him a letter that our protagonist brought along. It was written by the merchant, and as it turns out, the businessman knows Augustine pretty well, and the priest simply can't ignore his request. Besides the contents of that letter make it clear that somehow Lythe has acquired skills that he definitely shouldn't have according to the official assessment. In order to get to the bottom of this strange situation, he decides to have a meeting with our protagonist who shares the entire story in detail. He still can't believe that the goofy merchant is actually friends with such influential people like the Archbishop. However, he is happy that because of the merchant, he is getting another chance to understand his own powers. 
Augustine thanks our boy for saving his friend's life and says that he would be happy to reassess Lythe's skills even though it's highly unlikely that the results will change. He asks his servants to bring in the crystal and then instructs our protagonist to put his hand on the crystal to start the assessment. Lythe is desperately hoping that his jobless status will change this time around, but to his absolute dismay, the crystal still doesn't show any symbols which means our boy is still not part of any of the conventional classes. However, while our protagonist is busy cursing his luck, Augustine notices that according to the crystal, Lythe has acquired two new skills. Even more importantly, these skills only belong to people who are part of the warrior classes, and there is no way that our boy should have those. He explains that you can't simply acquire skills out of thin air, and you certainly can't give them to other people, so he doesn't understand how our protagonist received these skills when he still isn't part of any class. If he hadn't seen this with his own eyes, Augustine would have never believed such a thing, but he can't deny the facts, so he decides to further investigate the strange occurrence. To find out what kind of ability Lythe really has, the old priest decides to go through some of the more obscure books in his archives, and he asks our protagonist to accompany him. Our boy is mesmerized after seeing so many ancient and priceless books in one place, but Augustine's mind is somewhere else. He's going through one book after the other to find out how exactly someone can obtain new skills without being part of any class. Even though his memory isn't so great anymore, he still remembers that there used to be someone in the past who also wasn't assigned to any class. He's trying to read more about that person, and after doing some digging, he finds out exactly what he was looking for. He tells Lythe that according to old records, there once lived a person who also wasn't part of any class, but he had a very special skill. That person could mimic their opponent's skill thanks to their ability, and from the looks of it, our boy can do the same thing. However, there is one detail that even the book doesn't mention, but Lythe knows about it. He tells the old priest that he received those skills only after landing a couple of punches on the bandit leader. This basically means that there's a good chance our protagonist can copy someone's skills by simply hitting them. If it is true, it is a completely broken ability, but neither of them knows anything about it. That's exactly why Augustine asks Lythe to go out into the world and try to uncover more details about his power on his own. After having this really productive meeting with the Archbishop, our boy is feeling much better than he did only a few days ago. He has learned something very useful about himself, and he's happy that there is still a chance for him to do something special with his life. That's exactly why he decides to use this mysterious and completely overpowered ability to become a knight. However, you can't become a knight by simply picking up a sword and wearing goofy armor. It turns out you actually have to take an exam to get this job, and that's exactly why most people in warrior classes train so hard. In order to start the process, Lythe goes to the local office and signs up for the exam which is going to be held in a couple of days. After enrolling in the recruitment process, he decides to walk through the streets of the capital and see for himself why people shower so much praise on this place. He tries different kinds of street food as well as visits different shops and he is pretty amazed by how lovely this city really is. People are shopping as well as playing on the streets and having a good time. There are also many warriors and mages walking around town and our boy thinks they must be here for the exam. He is hoping to join the ranks of these strong warriors someday so he decides to start training for the exam since he doesn't really have a lot of time. However, he doesn't even get the chance to find a hotel before he hears a familiar voice calling for him. He quickly turns around to see Sarah who seems out of breath and kind of relieved to see him once again. However, there is also this bloodthirsty look in her rage-filled eyes, and Lythe is afraid that she's going to take his soul without any mercy. But to his surprise, she just runs over to him and gives him a hug before telling him how happy she is to see him again. Our protagonist immediately starts feeling guilty after seeing tears in her eyes because it's clear that he made a really bad decision to leave without telling her. However, before he can apologize for being an idiot, he tells her that maybe they should get off the streets before people start making up some rather scandalous stories about them. Sarah, of course, understands what he means, so the two of them go to the nearby woods where Lythe apologizes again and again for making her worried. He also tells her that his father threw him out and he had to work as a luggage carrier to make a living. He then excitedly explains how he fought off those bandits and how he ended up receiving new skills thanks to that ordeal. As soon as she hears about his new ability, Sarah gets really excited because now he can once again join her in all the battles that are definitely going to come her way. She asks him to show off the skills he has obtained so far by slicing through a huge boulder. Now Lythe is a little hesitant to use those skills because he doesn't know how well they will work, but he is willing to at least try. So he grabs his short sword and initiates physical boost as well as sword boost before jumping into the air and attacking that boulder straight on. He even surprises himself when he manages to carve a deep ridge through the boulder. 
Sarah is also impressed by what she just saw, and she tells him that he will definitely pass the night exam if he utilizes those skills to their full potential. This of course gives Lythe a huge boost in confidence and he starts looking forward to the exam once again. However, just before they go back to the city, his friend tells him that if he wants, she can also show him what kind of skills a holy knight has. Our protagonist is eager to see these special abilities, so Sarah proceeds to obliterate that boulder with a single strike. She hits it so hard that there aren't even traces left of that giant rock, and needless to say Lythe is blown away by her power. He now knows pretty well that even with his skills he is no match for her, but in his heart, he is willing to work hard to reach her level. To his surprise, however, his friend wants to share her skills with him. She asks him to give her a fist pump because she knows that Lythe's ability allows him to obtain new skills by touching his opponent. Our boy is not sure if he should just acquire so much power without any training, but he can't resist the urge to get those new skills, so he ends up punching Sarah's fist. Immediately, his ability kicks in, and a voice tells him that he has acquired two new skills. One of them happens to be a skill known as the Celestial Boost, which clearly is a physical type of skill. The other one, however, is known as the Celestial Blade, and our boy doesn't know what it does exactly. However, he is pretty sure that with these skills, he has now reached a completely new level. He thanks Sarah for what she did, but he also asks her if she is really okay with sharing her power with him. This is when his friend reminds him that you are not strong just because you have the best skills. You'll always have to train hard and learn how to use them properly, so until our boy puts in the work, she will stay ahead of him no matter how many skills he has. Still, by doing this, she is now certain that he will pass the night exam and soon join her as the newest member of the Order of the Imperial Knights. A couple of days after acquiring even more power, Lythe joins hundreds of other recruits who are here to become Knights of the Kingdom. After all these aspiring candidates gather in a courtyard, their training officer Roger comes to the balcony to get an idea of what kind of people are taking the exam this year. On the surface, it seems like most of these candidates aren't good enough to join the ranks of Imperial Knights, and the old officer isn't too happy after making this observation. He tells his secretary that knighthood is considered one of the greatest positions in this kingdom, and only the strongest warriors have any right to join this profession. In order to make sure of this, he likes to make the exam as hard as possible. But he also likes to inspire these candidates because who knows one day one of them might end up saving this kingdom from some kind of calamity. So he goes up to them and makes it clear that the only thing that matters in the order of Imperial Knights is your strength as a warrior. Your motivation for joining this profession or your previous rank doesn't matter at all once you decide to take this exam. And if you somehow manage to pass it, you will receive the title of Ninth, which essentially makes you a Baron, and that's a pretty high title. However, it's just the bottom of the ladder, and your status will keep increasing as long as you continue working hard. In fact, according to Roger, you can even surpass the highest aristocrats in this country if you manage to become the strongest knight in the kingdom. With this short speech, he makes it clear that might is right as long as Imperial Knights are concerned, so you should strive to become the strongest, and that makes the candidates happy and more hopeful about their future. Pretty soon, the exam officially begins, and Roger and his secretary start assessing the candidates. While going through their papers, the female officer notices that for some reason there is no class mentioned in Lythe's form. She is certain that this is some kind of a clerical error, but this is when our protagonist reveals that officially, he is jobless. This shocks the training officers who tell him that he is here to fight against people who have offensive skills as well as a lot of training. They remind Lythe that it will be pretty foolish to go up against such strong people when you don't even have a way to fight. Now at this point, our boy thinks about sharing the nature of his ability, but then he decides to stay quiet about it. Instead, he just tells the officers that he can fight so he'll be fine, and they shouldn't just rule him out just because he isn't part of any class. His bold statement makes Roger laugh, and he decides that our protagonist can participate in the exam because he wants to see what this kid can actually do. While the head training officer is more than happy to let Lythe take the exam, some of the candidates think it's a rather abhorrent idea. One of these candidates is an aristocrat named Logan who thinks that a jobless guy should not even be allowed to enter this training center. He's clearly trying to enrage our protagonist with his sharp remarks, but Lythe says that he has no time for meaningless people, and he is just here to become a knight. His nonchalant attitude only makes Logan angrier, and he grabs his sword and tries to attack our boy. However, Roger immediately tells him to lower his sword because the exam hasn't started, and they aren't allowed to fight without a reason. The aristocrat is of course still not happy to allow our protagonist to take this exam, but he also isn't stupid enough to fight a training officer, so he quickly backs off. 
However, just before walking away, he tells Lyth to be ready because he won't go easy on our boy if the two of them end up fighting in this exam. While our protagonist doesn't pay much attention to this threat, Roger starts laughing because clearly, this year's exam is going to be much more exciting than he initially thought. After all, one of the strongest candidates on paper has just picked a fight with a guy who seemingly has no fighting capabilities. However, while he was trying to stop Lyth from taking out his sword, he noticed that our boy actually is pretty strong physically, even though he might not look like much. This means that he is more than capable of surprising everyone in this arena, and that's exactly why Roger is looking forward to seeing the results of this exam. After making sure that no one is fighting or creating trouble without his permission, Roger and his subordinate gather everyone to explain the rules of this exam. He says that since they are going to become knights, it only makes sense that their recruitment is done by making them participate in mock battles. They will receive certain grades depending on how well they perform in these battles, so they should go all out in order to make sure that they get the best possible grade. However, he also makes it clear that the purpose of this test isn't to hurt them, so in order to ensure their safety, they will have to wear magical rings that will keep them alive no matter how much damage they take. These rings usually create a barrier around you, and you can win a fight by simply breaking the barrier around your opponent. Since the rules are simple enough, Roger believes that they should start the exam right away. He asks his junior officer to name the first two candidates, and unsurprisingly, these two happen to be the ones who were at each other's necks only a few minutes ago. While Logan's companions are certain that their illustrious friend will end this battle pretty quickly, Roger knows that it isn't going to be that simple. He asks Lythe and the aristocrat to enter the arena and wear those rings. He wants them to have a fair fight, but with so much bad blood between them, he knows that things might get out of hand. Still, he wants to see what's going to happen so he asks them to begin the exam. As soon as he gives this order, Logan uses his magic to create a fiery lance. Apparently, he comes from a much respected family of mages, so it's not surprising that he can use such high-level magic with ease. With a huge grin plastered on his face, he fires the lance straight at our protagonist, and before anyone can even react, the fighting arena gets engulfed in smoke. With dust and rubble flying all over the place, Roger couldn't see what exactly happened. However, as things settled down, it soon becomes clear to everyone that the fireball didn't even get anywhere near Lythe. In fact, he seems to have cut down the fireball with his short sword, which shouldn't even be possible, but it's all thanks to his celestial boost that he received from Sarah the other day. It gives him insane strength and also sharpens his reflexes. That's probably the reason why he was able to cut through such a strong attack without much trouble. While people around the arena are still trying to wrap their heads around Lythe's remarkable strength, Logan says that he is impressed by what our boy just did. He says that it should be illegal for jobless people to have such skills, but he is certain that even with his mysterious strength, our protagonist won't be able to win this fight. His confidence seems out of place, but anyone who knows him understands why he isn't scared of our boy. As it turns out, Logan is considered a prodigy who has mastered top-tier spells and his strength is no joke. To make sure that everyone understands how superior he is, he decides to use an even stronger magic. Since Lyth was able to cut down a single fiery lance, his opponent has decided to rain down fire on him until he gives up. Roger is well aware of just how strong this attack is, and he knows that our boy will likely die if he gets hit by it. That's exactly why he tries to stop the fight, but just then, Lyth brings out his other special skill. By using a celestial blade, he manages to cut through every single one of those fireballs, not to mention the entire wall of the castle as if it was made from wax. By the time people realize what just happened, Logan is on the ground wondering how this guy has acquired a skill that should only belong to a holy knight. He is of course scared by this point, but his ego won't let him back down and instead, he just gets angrier. By this point, he has realized that he will have to go all out to have any chance of winning against Lyth. So to finish this battle right here and right now, he brings out his strongest magic by far. It's another fire magic known as Dragon's Breath, and he fires it straight at our protagonist without even caring about what would happen to the people around them. Roger has to use his own skills to protect other candidates, but even he can't stop this fight, and it looks like this might be it for Lyth. However, it seems like our boy has seen the movie Terminator, and he just doesn't know when to give up. By using his sword, he manages to cut through that huge fireball and starts coming straight at Logan to finish this fight. His opponent tries to stop him by going all out with his magic, but it's too late and Lyth just swats him off like a fly and ends the fight in a spectacular fashion. By the time all is said and done, the aristocrat has been knocked out, which means our protagonist is the clear winner of this insane battle. While our boy is busy here dismantling snotty-nosed rich kids, Sarah is out there saving a kid and his mother from a bear-like monster. 
Thanks to her immense strength as a holy knight, taking down such scary monsters is child's play for her, and she always feels happy about helping others, so this is a pretty rewarding job for her. However, today, even while working, her mind is thinking about how well her friend performed during his examination. She is desperately hoping that he will soon become a knight like her, and from the looks of it, Lyth will soon be passing that exam. After all, against all odds, he has managed to defeat one of the strongest young mages in the kingdom. He has also shown everyone that he can use an incredibly strong skill like the Celestial Blade, which means he won't be losing to anyone as far as raw strength is concerned. And to make things even better, by winning the fight against Logan, he also manages to acquire his skills, which include three really strong fire-type spells. Our boy doesn't know if he will ever use them, but having a skill like Dragon Breath under his belt is certainly not going to hurt him. He is so lost in thinking about his new skills that he almost forgets to see if his opponent is even alive. He knows that he went way overboard with the Celestial Blade, and he is hoping against hope that Logan is not seriously injured. Luckily for him, the young aristocrat is pretty tough, and despite getting hit by such a strong attack, he seems to be alive and kicking. While everyone inside the arena is impressed by his skills, it's actually Roger who knows just how special Lythe really is. He is eagerly looking forward to seeing just how far this jobless son of a duke will go in life. But for now, it's time for the next match, so he steps inside the arena to continue the exam. But just before he can ask the next contestants to enter the arena, Logan stops Roger and asks him to disqualify our protagonist. This, of course, is a ridiculous demand, but the aristocrat believes our boy broke the code of chivalry by hiding his own strength. He further supports his claim by telling everyone that it is impossible for someone to acquire the Celestial Blade skill, which means either Lyth is already a holy knight or an actual holy knight helped him from behind the scenes. Even though he's just being salty, many candidates are starting to believe his theory, and they want an explanation for the incredible strength that our protagonist has shown in this battle. All of this is putting a lot of pressure on Roger, who doesn't want to create a scandal. So he asks his subordinate to suspend the results of the previous battle for now, but just then an unexpected guest enters the arena and silences everyone. Her name is Iris, and she happens to be the first princess of this kingdom. The candidates are of course confused to see such a high-ranking royal in a place like this, but it seems like the princess is on some kind of a mission. She tells everyone that according to her assessment, Lyth really doesn't belong to any particular class. However, she is also 100% sure that the skills he used during the battle are his own, which means he fought honorably in that mock battle. But the same can't be said about Logan, who according to her, broke the code of chivalry just to win. This surprises the aristocrat who says that he doesn't know what she's talking about. The princess, however, knows everything, and she goes to one of Logan's companions and asks her to confess how she helped her friend cheat during the exam. Apparently, this girl used fortifying magic to protect her friend during the mock battle, which is clearly against the rules. Usually, these guys would have lied to save their skins, but lying will be fruitless against someone like Iris who has the appraisal skill that allows her to assess any situation or scenario with 100% accuracy. Logan and his companions are trying to come up with an excuse when the princess asks the guards to arrest these cheaters because in her eyes, they deserve to be punished for breaking the code of honor. The aristocrat tries to plead his case, but it's no use, and soon he is taken away from the examination center along with his companions. After dealing with the psychotic cheater, Iris turns her attention to Lyth and with a rather mischievous smile on her face, tells him that from this day on, he will be one of her royal guards. Since she is a princess, her order is the law which means our boy can't even protest and has to go along with whatever she wants him to do. She takes our protagonist to the royal palace and brings him straight to her father Richard who happens to be the emperor of this kingdom. She proudly introduces her new royal guard to her father, and at that moment, Lyth starts thinking about all the decisions that have led him to be kneeling in front of the strongest man in this country. Just this morning, he was trying his best to become a member of the Knight's Order. Then, this pretty princess decided to hire him as one of her royal guards without even asking if he wanted to take the job. Of course, Roger tried to remind her that it was completely bonkers to give someone the top-ranked job when he wasn't even a knight. In fact, there are even rules that don't allow a knight to join the royal guard unless he has reached the seventh rank or higher. At the time of his appointment, our protagonist was a nobody, so legally he couldn't even become a royal guard. However, Iris was hell-bent on hiring Lythe, so she decided to bend the rules. In order to qualify our boy for the job, she gave him the seventh rank in the knight's order on his first day on the job. That's how he ended up becoming a royal guard. And as if all of this craziness wasn't enough, now he finds himself standing in front of the king once again on the very first day of his job. 
While our protagonist is thinking about the crazy day he has had, his new boss is happily telling her father how great life is with a sword. Our boy is certain that the Emperor will not allow him to join the Royal Guards, but despite the serious look on his face, Richard actually welcomes our protagonist and commends him for being a good warrior. He is saying how rare it is for his daughter to praise someone when Iris makes a rather shocking declaration. With no warning whatsoever, she loudly proclaims that she would love to marry Lythe and that's why she has decided to keep him close. Our protagonist is lost for words the moment he hears this, but to his surprise, the Emperor looks as calm as he did earlier. He even comes down from his throne and walks over to shake Lythe's hand, and for a second our boy thinks that things probably won't get as bad as he initially thought. However, the moment Richard grabs his hand, our protagonist gets hit by the Emperor's immense aura and suddenly he realizes that he is standing in front of arguably the strongest man in this kingdom. And as if that wasn't intimidating enough, he is now supposed to marry this guy's daughter, which is probably why the Emperor is looking at Lythe with those bloodthirsty eyes. Our boy has heard stories about how the Emperor took down entire armies in his youth, and there are even people who claim that he defeated a dragon with a single punch. Of course, our protagonist doesn't want to get on Richard's bad side, but he might not have a choice here. However, it turns out that despite the anguish on his face, the King is actually a rather nice guy who is happy to meet his future son-in-law. He says that he doesn't care what kind of background Lythe has because he only needs to have a good personality and talent as a warrior to marry his daughter. Our protagonist is positively surprised by how good the Emperor really is, but he still hasn't fully accepted that he'll be marrying the princess. For now, he's more than happy to be one of her royal guards, even if she's trying her best to make him fall in love with her. After this meeting with the Emperor, Iris decides to introduce her beloved Lythe to the rest of her royal guards. She tells our boy that he will report directly to her, and she would like him to closely observe his new colleagues because one of them is actually conspiring to eliminate her. This is a rather shocking revelation, but instead of elaborating on it, the princess takes Lythe to a small training hall and introduces him to the rest of her royal guards. A guard named Larg walks up to our boy and asks him which family he represents. Even though our protagonist belongs to a prominent noble family, he decides to hide his real identity and says that he's just a commoner. This answer surprises the other guard who thinks that Lythe must have done something amazing to reach this position. However, he soon learns that our boy has never worked as a knight before today. He's fresh from the assembly line, and this shocks Larg, who can't believe that someone was given the seventh rank on the first day of the job. He is seething with rage and asking our protagonist to give up the name of the corrupt official who promoted him to such a high rank without any merit. However, he quickly shuts his mouth after realizing that it's actually his boss, Iris, who chose Lythe for this prestigious job. She makes it clear to the other guards that they shouldn't underestimate our boy just because he is a rookie. She even asks Larg to have a sparring session with our protagonist if he really wants to see just how strong Lythe is. While our boy is not really in the mood to have another mock battle, the other guard is itching to fight. However, Urs, who happens to be the captain of the royal guards, makes it clear that there will be no friendly duels between them. He knows that Larg still hasn't fully recovered from a previous injury, so it will be foolish for him to fight someone who is strong enough to be a royal guard as well. But he is also eager to see why Iris picked a newbie for such an important position, so the captain says that he'll face Lythe in a friendly bout, and our protagonist accepts the challenge, since it's clear that he won't be able to avoid it. As these two get ready for the battle, the remaining royal guards are certain that their captain will win without any problem, since he is considered one of the most powerful knights in the world. The princess, on the other hand, knows how strong Lythe is, and she believes that he will put up a great fight. To make this match as fair and safe as possible, the captain decides that they won't use any offensive or defensive skills. It will be a test of just how good they are with their swords. They will have to wear protection rings to make sure they don't hurt each other. After making these preparations and setting up the rules, the fight begins, and it quickly becomes clear to Lythe just how strong his opponent really is. He's trying his best to land a clean blow on Urs, but the captain of the Royal Guards is incredibly strong and is able to keep up with our protagonist's speed. It doesn't take long for Larg to realize that this rookie is no joke, but as the battle goes on, it seems like Lythe won't be able to keep up with the captain for too long. Urs has the strength to crush mountains with his sword, and our boy is having a hard time even blocking these monstrous attacks. For a while, he tries his best to defend, but it's becoming more and more difficult for him to parry these attacks. Lythe quickly realizes he will have to finish this battle soon, or he will run out of stamina, so he decides to go on the offensive. Unfortunately, the captain is expecting this, and he uses his experience to win the battle. He later reveals to our protagonist that he created too many openings while attacking, and this allowed Urs to win the fight. 
However, he says that despite landing the decisive blow, he has effectively lost the match and this surprises the princess as well as the other royal guards. They don't understand what their captain is saying, so Urs has to explain the reason why he considers himself to be a loser. He says that in order to finish the fight, he had to use his skill, and since that's against the rules, he has lost this friendly match. Everyone is shocked by this result, but Urs praises Lyth for pushing him to the limit. He tells everyone that the rookie is actually pretty strong and he'll be happy to see just how far our boy will go as his strength continues to grow. He also makes another shocking declaration. He tells the royal guards that from this day on he is no longer the one responsible for protecting the princess. Apparently he has been assigned a different duty so someone else will have to act as a shield between Iris and anyone who tries to hurt her. After hearing this, Larg and the other guards are hoping that this duty will be passed on to one of them, but to their surprise, Urs chooses Lyth for this position and doesn't even give any reasoning behind this decision. He only tells the guards that their next important mission is to protect the princess as she travels to a nearby state on a diplomatic mission. The captain is confident that even though he won't be traveling with them, they can protect Iris as long as they stay sharp and don't make any stupid decisions. While his confidence is admirable, Lyth is a little concerned because he only has two other guards accompanying him on this journey. One of them is Larg, and the other one is Lieutenant Zack. The lieutenant seems like a nice guy who seems to have an unlimited supply of energy because he's always pushing others to train as much as they can. After observing him for a bit, Lytha believes that this happy-go-lucky guy is actually a good choice for this job, and this makes him more confident about this mission. Just before they leave the palace, Iris decides to tell our protagonist why she chose him to be one of her guards. She explains that some time ago, she discovered something bad about the Order of the Imperial Knights, and ever since then, her life has been in danger. Since she couldn't trust just any other knight to protect her, she wanted to choose someone who hadn't been corrupted by the order just yet. That's why she went to the examination center and chose our boy for this job. She also goes on to explain that the person trying to eliminate her is the second Princess Camilla. Lyth is rather surprised by everything that the princess has told him, but apparently she wants to share something even more important with him. However, she doesn't want to do it while traveling through busy streets, so she asks him to come to her room that night. When the sun finally sets, our boy really wants to just crash in his bed and fall asleep, but he remembers that he has to meet up with the princess, so he starts looking for her room. He is wandering through the hallways when suddenly Iris pulls him into a room and takes him in her arms. She then proceeds to get on top of him and asks him if he would like to spend the night with her. Lyth is of course confused and nervous because he doesn't know what to say, so he just sits there with a rather innocent look on his face as Iris tries to kiss him. However, he ends up making a little bit of noise and this alerts Zack, who is also patrolling the hallway. He immediately starts knocking on the door and asks the princess if she's okay. He also tells her that he has important news that he would like to share with Iris right away. The princess doesn't want the lieutenant to see our protagonist, so she instructs Lythe to hide in the closet while she tells Zack to come in. She asks the lieutenant why he needs to see her in the middle of the night, and he explains that a band of thieves is coming to raid this hotel so they need to get out of here. While he is explaining the situation, he slowly gets behind Iris and tries to attack her. But just then, Lyth pops out of the closet and stops the lieutenant from hurting the princess. He asks the madman to explain why he is committing this act of treason, but clearly, Zack is in no mood to explain his actions. He says that he'll just take out both of them in order to make sure no one knows that he was involved. Iris is in shock to realize that an upstanding guy like the lieutenant is actually conspiring against her. She's trying to reason with him when he suddenly fires a stone lance straight at her. Luckily, Lyth is quick enough to protect the princess from the incoming projectile. However, Zack isn't a one-trick pony, and he uses another technique known as the Stone Hand to take out our protagonist as well as the princess. Once again, our boy uses his quick reflexes to push Iris out of danger, but he gets trapped by that hand, and it looks like this is it for him. Zack is pretty happy to see that this seemingly invincible rookie isn't that strong, and he says that he'll blame our protagonist for Iris' death after he's removed both of them from this world. He is grinning from ear to ear, thinking that he has completed his mission, but this is when Lyth decides to use his special skill. He punches Zack in the face without any warning, and the lieutenant starts laughing at this. He says that such a weak punch won't even tickle him, but he fails to realize that our boy was never really trying to hurt him. He just wanted to acquire Zack's skills, and after obtaining those, he manages to break himself free. The lieutenant is, of course, surprised by what is happening right in front of his eyes, and he tries to fight back, but it's useless. Lyth just grabs him with the stone hands and takes him out by using the fiery lance. 
Now that he has taken out the traitor, he quickly turns his attention to the princess to see if she's okay. Luckily, Iris isn't hurt at all, and she's just worried about the small injuries that Lythe has received in his fight against Zack. While all of this is going down, Ride finds out that his son has become a member of the Royal Guards, and he is simply astonished by this news. His shock turns into rage when he learns that our protagonist also aced the night exam and was promoted to the seventh rank on the very first day of his job. After destroying a table, he asks his servant how this is even possible. As far as he knows, his son was not assigned to any class, so it should be impossible for him to land such a prestigious job. However, this question forces his servant to reveal something that only makes Ride angrier. He learns that apparently the son he abandoned only a few days ago used the Celestial Blade during his recruitment exam, and this makes no sense to him whatsoever. The servant makes it clear that this really happened because the princess was there to observe it, and she chose him to be the royal guard for this very reason. By this point, the Duke is boiling with rage, and he's acting like a total maniac. In an extremely rough way, he asks his servant to find out how his useless son became so strong. He clearly wants answers, but his servant is just as clueless as him and he just begs his master to let him go. Eventually, Ride has mercy on the poor guy and asks him if Kite knows about it. This is when the servant explains that the heir to the Wellesley family is well aware of his brother's exploits. However, instead of breaking down furniture, Kite is taking out goblins to blow off steam. He also doesn't understand how his half-brother acquired the skills of a holy knight, and this lack of knowledge is only few fueling his anger. He's destroying entire colonies of monsters all the while thinking that his brother must have cheated to become a seventh-ranked knight while he is still stuck in the lowest rank. This should be impossible considering Lythe was not assigned to any class, and as he finishes off the leader of these goblins, Kite is certain that this has to be a sick prank. By the time he finishes his onslaught, the entire colony of monsters is gone. This is when his father comes up to him to tell him that he has nothing to worry about because his half-brother can never surpass him. Ride also believes that his son has used some underhand method to reach the seventh rank, which means he won't be able to stand up to someone like Kite in a real battle. This is exactly why the Duke wants his heir to face off against his half-brother in an upcoming duel tournament. By defeating Lythe, Kite can not only increase his rank, but also make it clear that his brother is a fraud. Since this tournament is especially for new members of the Knight's Order, our protagonist will most likely take part in it, and this will be a great chance for his brother to surpass him. While the Duke is busy setting up a battle between his own sons, Urs meets up with Lythe and Iris after the attack. Our protagonist is surprised to see the captain since he was supposed to be on some other mission. However, it turns out the captain was always near the princess and watching over her from a distance. He wanted to stay away in order to smoke out the traitor who was after her life, and he was right outside the window when Zack decided to finally make his move. He was thinking about taking down the traitor when he realized that Lythe had things under control, so he didn't intervene and let our boy deal with the culprit. He explains that he was already a little suspicious of the lieutenant who had been acting strange for a while now. Urs also believes that Zack was likely hired by Princess Camilla, who has her eyes fixed on the throne of this kingdom. She knows that she has to take out her elder sister in order to have any kind of claim on the throne, and that's why she is sending her pawns after Iris. Lythe is wondering how someone can scheme against their own sister when the princess tells him about the duel tournament that's going to start in a week. She says that pretty much all the important people in the kingdom will attend it, which means Camilla will be there as well. That's exactly why she wants Lythe to show everyone how strong he is, because it will act as a warning to them to not mess with Iris or her royal guards. She is once again asking a lot of our protagonist, who is barely beginning to understand his own strength, but the sincerity in her words makes him realize that she really needs him. He might not have been a knight for too long, but he is still bound by his oath, which means he's going to serve his master to the best of his abilities, so he agrees to take part in the tournament. A week later, warriors from all over the kingdom start gathering in the capital to attend this prestigious tournament. Once again, the streets are packed with people who are eager to see these legendary warriors go head-to-head -head in crazy battles. Unsurprisingly, Sarah is also there since she is a member of the Central Knightly Order. She is walking through the streets and trying different kinds of food when she comes across Lythe, who is really happy to see her again. Apparently, the princess also knows the Holy Knight and wants to recruit her to her royal guard someday, while our protagonist is really happy to see his best friend Sarah is surprised to find him walking around with the princess. She looks a little flustered, and Iris is quick to notice it, so she takes Lythe in her arms and explains that she hired him to be one of her royal guards. The Holy Knight looks surprised, as well as a little disappointed after hearing this, and the princess knows the reason behind her reaction. She goes up to Sarah and asks her if she also happens to like our boy, and this question catches the young girl off guard. She's trying to come up with an answer when Iris tells her that she can also become a member of the royal guards and work alongside Lythe if she can win the tournament. Even though 
though it will be extremely hard for her to win, Sarah isn't about to give up on the guy she has admired all her life. She is about to tell the princess what she thinks when suddenly they hear some commotion coming from a nearby stall. Apparently, a thief is using ice magic to steal stuff from unsuspecting visitors, and now people are scared to even walk the streets. This, of course, makes Iris a little angry, and she asks Lythe and Sarah to find this criminal and bring him to justice. However, they don't even have to go anywhere because the thief appears in front of them while holding a huge snowball in his hand. He says that he's going to knock out everyone in this market and then get out of there with all the loot before anyone can catch him. He clearly isn't scared of all the warriors roaming these streets, but it turns out he should be scared because some rather freaky people are visiting this town. One of these men happens to be a mage who calls the thief a fly. The criminal, of course, feels insulted by this comment, but before he can do anything, the mage blows him out of the sky with one of his spells. He then just gets out of there, ignoring all the people who are trying to compliment him for protecting them. It doesn't take long for Lythe to realize that this guy is extremely strong, and he asks Iris if she knows him. The princess explains that this stranger is actually the sage of the East Knightly Order. His name is Julius, and it's pretty clear that he is someone that Lythe will have to look out for during the tournament. And this is how this segment of the manga ends. If you liked the story and want us to continue, please leave a comment down below with the name Iris.